Funding for this program is provided by Annenberg CPB to advance excellent teaching. A production of South Carolina ETV and ACSN. The president said uh, that he wanted me to, uh, uh, to be in his cabinet, and, and that was important to me. But that wasn't as important as the next thing he said, is that he wanted me to be the Secretary of Education. Education is back in a big way at the federal level. I have no magic bullets, and there is not one. The only magic bullet is, is quality teaching and quality learning. One magic bullet probably wouldn't be enough. Education in the United States is in big trouble. We're really just kidding ourselves. We're not challenging our youngsters. We're, we're not producing people who can think, who can read, who can write, um, uh, who know very much about science. Uh, uh, the arts and music are a disaster in terms of education. Foreign languages, here we are, world power, a world where uh, movement is so fast, and this is, uh, uh, Europeans are moving to a system where every high school graduate is going to know his or her own language and two other languages and we have hardly anybody who knows one other language it's a disaster I'm into getting the job done and I'm into what impacts best for children you have uh, for the first time in 12 years a president and the uh, leadership of both the Senate and the House of the same party uh, the signal is break gridlock to end gridlock Richard Riley has to begin in his own Department of Education I knew these people when they were young interns and, and the like, and I think they've been beaten down. And I don't like to walk down a hall and see people, you know, sitting at desks, seemingly not working. Part of the gridlock? Literally hundreds of interest groups that want something from the Department of Education. Do you want more money? Sure. Uh, a lot more money. We always want more money. Do you have access to Dick Riley? Yes. You call him up and talk to him? Yes. I can call him and talk to him. Uh, he's called me several times and talked to me. This is the most important position as far as Dick Riley is concerned in the country. If you start out with a good education, your chances of making it in life are so much improved. If you don't, your problems are so much enlarged, and we know that. Uh, what we don't know is exactly how to do it right for everybody. What we're about is the most important thing this country is dealing with, and I think everybody senses that. Bill Clinton thinks that. He thinks this business of education is the most important thing that the country faces. Who is Richard Riley and what's his plan for American education? Will what he does in the next four years in Washington, D.C. have an impact on you or on your children? I'm John Mara. Welcome to Learning Matters. Learning Matters is made possible by grants from the people of Toyota, who believe that striving for excellence is not just a goal, but a way of life. Learning Matters is also made possible by grants from the Pew Charitable Trusts, Carnegie Corporation of New York, and the Rockefeller Foundation. The United States Department of Education, annual budget over $30 billion. Nearly 5,000 men and women work for the department. It's early morning, and Secretary Riley is holding his weekly breakfast meeting with his inner circle, which includes Deputy Secretary Madeleine Cunin, former governor of Vermont, and Dr. Marshall Smith, Riley's number three person. The president's theme of the whole budget is change. If Dick Riley has his way, he's going to encourage states to look at what kids learn in other countries, what they're capable of doing. And instead of having a kid and a parent who feel good about themselves because they're getting phony marks on very low content material, uh, a couple of years from now, your youngster will be learning more challenging things. We'll be learning much more. We'll be learning what kids are learning in other countries, and that that's going to make a big difference. Most of their countries have, have uh, equalization uh, programs where almost all the schools get the same amount of money. And so they don't worry about the same kinds of, of issues as we do. Basically, we're still teaching in this country as we taught when we were still an agrarian society. 
And I think we have to look at that and say, how can we change the system? How can we address the problems of a technological society now, a society competing in a global economy? And we can't do it using the same means we used when we were an agrarian society. We also have great disparities in education in this country. You know, we have schools that are outstanding, that are the model uh, probably uh, uh, of any other country in the world. But we also have schools where there's great despair, you know, where they're struggling to keep guns out of school. You know, if, you're, if you have a metal detector as the first sight when you enter into school, it's a little hard to figure out what college you're going to apply to that day. We've had a history of agencies not being able to work together on these programs and to have uh, Secretary Reich and all his people and, and Secretary Shalala and her people working with you all makes it, uh, makes it all work well. Riley wants his department to work with other cabinet departments, cooperation leading to action. But what does action mean in Washington, D.C.? I think people tend to forget that this government was founded on the principle of dynamic inaction. Uh, you remember the founding fathers, they wanted a, they wanted a government that wasn't going to do anything except provide, uh, keep the British away if the British decide to come back. So there is in the Constitution power for the national defense, but there really isn't much. Everything else is split up, divided uh, in a system of checks and balances that is really uh, pretty well designed to keep anything from happening. The whole point is to get it off the ground. Right. Um, the longer they delay on the bill, the harder it's going to be for people to implement those programs. So all this motion is real movement? It's real movement and it's worthwhile and it's going to make a difference. What do you hope to accomplish in however long you're here? Well, what I hope to accomplish, of course, and the president hopes to accomplish, is to bring about uh, a movement uh, in this country to uh, understand that this business of a systemic reform, that is the curriculum, high standards, uh, teacher preparation, textbooks, all of the different aspects of education fit and are in sync, working with the creativity from the classroom teacher and also the curriculum framework. Changing a lot of things at once. Changing a lot of things at once and everything and the sum of the parts is greater than all of them. Bill Clinton and uh, the others in that uh, uh, cabinet are lucky to have somebody who is as much of an optimist as Dick Riley uh, with them because he doesn't give up. I've been with him in some mighty tough fights where practically everybody around him had said there's got to be a certain point at time when you say we've lost we've got to concede. He just doesn't concede. You know, you asked, is he tough enough? Buddy, he's about as tough a guy as I ever saw. He's tough. Um, he, he, will, he will battle you. He's tenacious. He's combative. Um, but he does it in a civil way. And when one gets through with that, uh, going through that confrontation with him, one still has a lot of respect for him and, frankly, uh, a lot of personal uh, like and warmth for the individual. So we've got a lot of work to do analyzing that and then how we say that to the American people is important to, uh, to try to make it meaningful uh, where it would be useful information. All the things that you and I want in a public yeah, servant, he's that, they're there uh, and he's there. Um, he's serious, intelligent, core of decency, he knows why he's there, he's to serve. Richard Riley began public service as a legislator in his home state of South Carolina in 1963. In 1967, he was elected to the state senate. Now, there's a great frustration out there, and, and part of that frustration is, is what I call the good old boy system, uh, the, the old way of doing things. Uh, you help me and I'll help you kind of deal. Uh, and the public's had enough of that. He really wanted to govern in the best sense of that word. And that meant to him uh, that no task was ignoble. All tasks were necessary and noble to govern. Friends say that Riley's special compassion for the handicapped and the down and out derives from his own experience. At age 22, he developed spondylitis, a degenerative and untreatable bone disease that left him with a rigid spine. Dick had a pen stand on his desk that really defines the man I knew when we were in state government together. And it just had two words on it. It said, the worker. 
a liberal and a fundamentally conservative state, Riley believed that education reform was common sense because South Carolina was at or near the bottom in all national rankings. In 1978, he was elected governor. I think that there's a real spark out there, uh, support for public education, uh, and really all I can do is kind of light the spark. During his first term, Riley persuaded the legislature to change the Constitution to allow South Carolina governors to have a second term. I, Richard Wilson Riley, which he then won. During his second term, he became more fervent about education. If toil is our blessing, however, then education is the means by which we achieve long-term salvation for our state. Jobs and education are are more than goals for the people of South Carolina. They are so basic, they are so fundamental, that they go beyond a consideration of standards or objectives. They should be viewed, as I see it, as nothing less than absolute birthrights for every person born in this state. The birthright to work and the birthright to learn. He's got that style of kind of the male fist in the velvet glove approach. He'd make them like it. Uh, he's got a very interesting leadership style. People talk about building consensus. That's very popular in uh, uh, governmental discussions now. But he really knew how to redefine the discussion in such a way that he made the different groups carry on the debate and formulate the compromise themselves. There's a real art to that. There's a real talent to that. That if you, the, the people of South Carolina, want better education, then it will be done. He saw a need based on test scores and what was happening with our educational institutions, particularly K through 12 in the state, that we needed additional funding. And the only way to sell this was uh, through an additional penny sales tax, which he pushed through, and it's called the Educational Improvement Act in the state. I'm recommending that the revenue from the one cent sales tax increase be put in a special account in the budget, separate from the general fund, and used only for quality education. And you look at in South Carolina, what do they achieve? Well, the EIA, the Educational Improvement Act, is one of the great achievements of any governor at any time in American history, particularly in the state, which is basically predominantly Republican, very conservative. All you members of the House and Senate, come on around, everybody. What Dick Riley did, and this is very important as far as public policy and public consciousness, he raised education to a, to a major level of, of policy debate in the state, and it has been on the front burner of policy debate since then, and will be. South Carolina was the only state where, where the teachers felt good about what was happening. They all knew that it was different, something was happening, and they felt that it was good for them and, and good for the youngsters. So that's, that's a very high mark. Those high marks attracted the attention of other governors, including Arkansas's Bill Clinton, who has often referred to Riley as his mentor. He and, and I have consulted each other for years, really since 1979, uh, on matters of importance. And so it came as no great surprise when President-elect Clinton called on Riley to help with the transition, or when President Clinton asked him to become Secretary of Education. When the president called, former Governor Riley, now 60 years old, was senior partner in a major law firm in Columbia, South Carolina, earning more than $600,000 a year. Why take a half a million dollar pay cut to move to Washington? You give all that up to go to a uh, relatively lower paying government job in this immense bureaucracy that's uh, public education in this country. What are you doing? But I think he really has the excitement that uh, uh, and the belief that uh, real change can be accomplished in the Clinton administration. But it's part of the whole Riley persona. I'm mean, going to go back to overcoming his own disability, getting involved in public life, the commitment as a reformer, as a senator here in South Carolina, as a governor, um, the opportunity uh, to serve the nation. He was called, and, and he's that kind of person. Education is a state responsibility. When the federal government has gotten involved in education, it's usually been for other reasons, like the economy, or civil rights, or poverty. Secretary Richard Riley does not have the power over education that Governor Riley did. By tradition, education has been a local function. It's a state responsibility 
but a very, very important federal concern. We are forbidden by the law which set up the Department of Education to have a national curriculum. Since the first public schools opened in the middle of the 19th century, towns and cities have run their own schools without any help or hindrance from Washington, D.C. In the first 100 years of public education in this country, the federal government did only two things of significance for education. It set aside public land for colleges in 1862, and it opened an office of education in 1867 with a staff of only four. Now he was a veteran who had growing confidence in himself and in his leadership. At the end of the Second World War, with millions of soldiers returning home facing unemployment, President Roosevelt and the Congress got involved in education for economic reasons. The GI Bill of 1944 sent 7 million veterans off to college and helped fuel an economic boom. Half a century later, the enduring legacy of the GI Bill is the strongest economy in the world and the broadest, biggest middle class that any nation has ever enjoyed. Washington's next involvement in education was a matter of justice, civil rights, not schooling. In 1957, President Eisenhower ordered federal troops to Little Rock, Arkansas to protect young black students at a formerly all-white school. Three years earlier in 1954, the U.S. Supreme Court had ruled school segregation unconstitutional. It took the Russians to get Washington interested in education again. The launch of Sputnik, the first space satellite in 1957, made America aware of shortcomings in math and science. Afraid that we were losing the space race to the communists, Congress passed the National Defense Education Act, pumping federal money into schools to improve science and math teaching. Defense was the key word. Education was Washington's business if it helped win the Cold War. But 1965, Lyndon Johnson put together the first elementary secondary education act which we're going to reauthorize this year it was during lyndon johnson's presidency in the nineteen sixties that washington assumed its modern role in education here the motivation was poverty johnson's war on poverty relied heavily on school-based programs like head start throughout the nineteen seventies federal dollars flowed to schools and colleges from what was still called the office of education but even with increases in federal spending 90% of the money for education came from states and local communities. President Jimmy Carter upped the ante for education. The only uh, new department that I know of that ought to be created is a separate Department of Education. In Congress, his proposal struck a nerve. Mr. Speaker, I have spent considerable time studying the merits of H.R. 2444, and after a careful analysis of its long-term implications, have come to the conclusion that an enactment of this bill would be a serious mistake. The plain truth is that the federal government has no special competence for improving the quality of education or student performance. That we're really talking about more bureaucracy, more government power, more regulations, more programs, bigger and bigger government, and that adds up to, in the final analysis, less education. Because the more time educators are spending doing federal government paperwork, the less time they're spending with the children. When the Department of Education opened in 1979, it was already a campaign issue for candidate Ronald Reagan. When the Reagan period began, Mr. Reagan, you remember, arrived in town and announced he was going to shut down the department. I became Secretary of Education. Uh, Ronald Reagan appointed me, and I went in and everybody saluted me, and, you know, they gave me the the hat, I, mean, I say the hat, figuratively the hat and the uniform, I mean the office, the portrait, you know, and here's your private dining room, sir, and, you know, like you're captain on this big ship and they give you a big steering wheel, you know, and you're steering and you're steering and you're steering, you're having a great time and then you look out and you see, oh, you're steering to the right, which is what I was steering, this thing's, this barge is going right down the water, just the way it always went, you know, and then you go down below, you check below the wheel and you find out your wheel is going to a rope, but it's not attached to anything. So you're up there, Secretary of Education, you're giving speeches, you're having a jolly good time, you're spitting your wheel. This damn thing is just rolling right down the river like it always has. Because the people in down below in the boiler room and down the engine room are steering it where they want to steer it. I remember when uh, Ted Bell became Secretary of Education and he was, uh, his major agenda was to dismantle the Department of Education that had just been established. And, in 1980 and he really um, asked for a budget 
of $9.3 billion, and it's up to over $30 billion now. George Bush increased federal education spending slightly. He also worked with Bill Clinton of Arkansas and the other governors to write national education goals. I was in Charlottesville, Virginia three years ago for the education summit, and I know that Republican and Democratic governors alike talked to President Bush not about what the federal programs in education were doing to the states, but what the programs that the federal government should be assuming its rightful responsibility like Medicare and Medicaid and health care were pushing down to the states and therefore the states were having to pick up more of that and therefore they were having to push the education more to the local responsibility and that's why you're seeing the problems with millage elections all over the united states today federal government has reneged on its pro on its what it should be doing pushed it down to the state the states had to take over those responsibilities therefore they pushed the education further down to the local and now the locals are beginning to rebel now we must create a new legacy that gives a new generation of Americans the right and the power to explore the frontiers of science and technology and space. The frontiers of the limitations of our knowledge must be pushed back so that we can do what we need to do. And education is the way to do it, just as surely as it was more than 100 years ago. Bill Clinton's first budget as president gives the Education Department a smaller increase than George Bush had proposed. But President Clinton intends to make education even more of a federal issue. Incidentally, that is what secretaries for the last 12 years have not done. They have essentially taken a position that education was something going on outside of Washington and in the mood of the previous administrations, you sort of worked against Washington, not with it. The secretary's perspective is very different, and that is that if you want to have things done here at the federal level, if you want nationwide action for education, you've got to work with the Congress and work with the major education groups in order to assure it happens. I know <clears throat> Madeline, who's a former governor, uh, we talk about in her state of Vermont and mine in South Carolina, we thought we had momentous decisions every day, and here... Uh, we make uh, decisions, and Terry Peterson, who was with me in South Carolina, we make decisions involving education here uh, every hour. Those decisions aren't made in a vacuum. They're made here. This is Mr. Riley's neighborhood, and it is a tough neighborhood. Our tour of the neighborhood begins here, in Riley's own education department. It administers nearly 250 federal programs. It's in four buildings here in Washington and in ten regional offices around the country. Riley's first job is to make his 5,000 employees feel wanted. They haven't felt that way for a long time. Imagine working in an, an agency where the president says, it's worthless, it's pointless, it's just getting in the way, we ought to shut it down. And in those 12 years, they did a very good job. It has been ground down in just about every way. It has lower morale, and it has not uh, been able to attract, in its middle-level ranks, and in its leadership over these past 12 years, a very significant cadre of leaders. Uh, I, I have a great positive feeling about people. If you, uh, if you challenge them, if you work with them, if you get close to them. When Riley came in as the Secretary of Education, he went around and knocked on doors and shook hands with uh, everybody throughout the department or made himself available to be greeted by them. And, and most people were like kids in a candy store. It was like, you know, and I think that's kind of sad, you know. <laughs> it was like, isn't this wonderful that the secretary came to see us? Um, and a, a little thing like that, you know, went a long way in terms of um, morale. If you excite people, you get them working as a team, uh, that's what we're doing here, and it's going to work. If somebody does something good, career people, no matter where they are, whether they're in this department or elsewhere, just scratch off in your own handwriting a note and send it to them. Let them know that they're doing something good. It gets you an awful long way in, in terms of, of reputation about how the secretary approaches a lot of different problems, not only the relationship between career people and political people, but just the general ambience about the way the Department of Education is being run. I think he's brought in people. My contacts with them so far are, uh, they are uh, whatever their age, they're young. Uh, they're 
there's something going on. The deputy, uh, I know some of them from earlier, I know of some of them from earlier times. Uh, there's a, an extreme intelligence uh, and, an, and, a, and a determination to help make things right. N no miracles. It's good to have Dr. Kapner uh, with us, uh, who is going to uh, head up, uh, of course, this area for us and coming in from the New York City system and a uh, longtime president of uh, Manhattan Borough Community College. And it's good to have you with us, uh, Gussie. The top people in any cabinet department are political appointees. The education department has 140 of them. Their job is to advance the president's political agenda, and they're supposed to leave when their president leaves. But often these political appointees get their status changed. They become civil servants, basically permanent jobs. It's called burrowing in. After 12 years of conservatives in the White House, how many Republicans are now walking these halls? Barnacles of conservatism all over the Department of Education. Maybe. I mean, there have been 12 years, there have been some people careered in, as we say, in government. Uh, there are probably more Republicans and conservatives in the Department of Education now than there have ever been. Still, I wouldn't guess it's a majority or anything close to a majority. There, there'd be some, and I imagine there are probably some pretty intense search and destroy missions going on right now to find these, um, these Republicans wherever they're, wherever they're hidden. I haven't spent any time whatsoever trying to figure out who anybody is. I'm trying to figure out who is willing to work hard and who can produce. What does the Department of Education do? Over 80% of its $30 billion budget is allocated by law to programs for the disadvantaged or for college loans and grants, for example. The Department of Education is not to education what the Department of Defense is to defense. I mean, the Department of Defense is to defense, period. I mean, the defense of the United States rests in the hands of the Department of Defense. The Secretary of Education has no such role. Uh, analog a role analogous to that in terms of the education of the country. He's got some programs. He's got $30 billion, $25, 30000000000 billion. He's got a bully pulpit. Uh, he's got uh, a relationship uh, with uh, a large number of educational entities around the country. But he cannot, uh, it is not up to him to say, now this shall be done in American schools. The best thing that Washington has, that the president has, that the secretary has, that all of us who are part of this team have, is something called the bully pulpit. You know, what we can influence is the value that parents, that communities place on education. And we can also begin to influence setting higher standards. The Clinton administration, including Dick Riley, is using technology to make that bully pulpit as far-reaching and effective as possible. This rehearsal is for a town meeting on summer job programs for youth. Good evening and welcome to all of you in the thousands of communities around the country taking part in our satellite town meeting for the month of April. Let's continue our tour of Mr. Riley's neighborhood. Up on that hill, 100 senators and 435 representatives make up the United States Congress, which looms over Mr. Riley's education department. But it turns out the secretary has more than a passing acquaintance with Capitol Hill. For a year after law school, uh -huh. I had an opportunity to an offer to work with the two U.S. Senators. One was Senator Olin Johnston and one was Senator Strom Thurmond, both were Democrats at that time. Oh, that's right. Thurmond was a Democrat. Uh, Olin Johnston offered me 8000 a year <laughs> and Strom Thurmond 7500 So uh, I figured that out in a hurry. <laughs> I uh, worked for Olin Johnson for about a year. There are power centers uh, uh, on the hill uh, that have to be uh, dealt with. Uh, the important thing is to understand those power centers, uh, to try to uh, use your persuasion uh, and, and capacity uh, to, to move them and to try to make them move in, in the direction that Bill Clinton wants to move things as far as education is concerned. I intend to work very closely with you, uh, as all of us, uh, join together to implement our shared vision of effective and innovative and accountable education systems. The major turnstile to get through is the Congress itself, uh, where there are differences of opinion, but there, are, there is generally very strong support 
for education reform. That's not to say that I haven't gone into some meetings and really gotten uh, hopped on by some people because that's happened. Uh, but that's part of it. That's happened to me in South Carolina with the legislature uh, when I was governor. At least 10 different committees and subcommittees can and will summon the secretary to testify on subjects as diverse as student loans, education for the handicapped, school lunch programs, and vocational education. Congress can be a demanding neighbor. He definitely is trying to get to know our neighborhood. We don't have to go down there. He comes up here regularly. Do you feel that you have a whole bunch of different bosses up there on the hill who have control over what you'd like to do? Well, in that case, you do have people that have pieces of responsibility and power that you have to work through. Uh, you can't tell them what to do. For Dick Riley, who are the two most important people up on the Hill? In Congress right now, I would suspect it's, it's probably three. It's probably Senator Kennedy and Representatives Ford and Kildee in the Education and Labor Committees. Uh, he has to work with them. Uh, the program that he puts through is going to be work, uh, worked in conjunction with them, and they would be very important to him. Do you, up on the Hill, think of yourself in some way as being Dick Riley's boss? No, we're part of the team. We're part of the same education team. He's the chief educator, in a sense. He's been appointed by the president to oversee all federal education programs. But we're part of that team, too, and I think he recognizes that equality uh, of the branches of government. And he knows that uh, there's no fiat that can uh, improve education in this country, that he has to work with the Congress, work with the governors, and try to put together a plan that will work in the country. A Democratic Congress is going to have a very difficult time saying, hey, we've got a president now. We've got an administration. We've got secretaries out there. They're ours. <laughs> uh, it's not our job now to stop everything or... I mean, that's, that's what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to provide the leadership. That's what we always complained about when we had George Bush there. We said, hey, the country's never going to move forward if it doesn't have a leader. Now you've got leadership there. Riley's going to go up and say, ladies and gentlemen, this is a tough one, but I propose more money. And they're going to say, gosh, it is a tough one. We're going to give you more money. I mean, this is not going to be very difficult uh, for these people. And, and uh, uh, they, they control both ends of Pennsylvania Avenue now. They will have their way. It turns out Bill Clinton's first budget asked Congress for less money for the Department of Education than George Bush had planned to. That came as a disappointment to some of Dick Riley's other neighbors, the National Education Association, the teacher union. Over there, the American Federation of Teachers, another teacher union. Nobody knows how many education groups there are in Washington, D.C., but there are at least 250 of them. Groups representing superintendents, principals, handicapped children, banks that make student loans, school boards, big city schools, they're all over this neighborhood. You lived in this neighborhood. Mm -hmm. It's a rough neighborhood. Who's, uh, what's he got to look out for? Well, it's, it's like moving into a neighborhood. The day you get there, even the day before you get there, uh, people are calling you up and coming by and telling you where to walk and how to walk and who to be friends with and what the rules of the road are where you should go to eat and who you should talk to and who you shouldn't talk to. And you say, hey, wait a minute, I just moved into this neighborhood. I'll find my own way. If somebody said, Emily, who runs American education in this country, I would have to say the education groups. They have lots of money, and they want things to go their way. This doesn't make education so much different from lots of other things in Washington, except it may surprise people to hear that this is true of organizations like the National Education Association or the PTA. You worked hard to elect Bill Clinton. Yes, the NEA did. did. Is this a time now where you calling in your chits? Or you... No, no, we're, we, we won't call in. I don't know what calling in chits means. I believe we have the opportunity to provide input into the whatever the president is doing, whatever the cabinet members are doing, but I don't believe that we've asked for these ten things and we expect five or six or seven of those. We simply haven't done that. We won't do it. I mean, the NEA is the single most powerful uh, constituent of Bill Clinton's. So it is the most single most powerful force in the Democratic Party. You the NEA... I mean, Bill Clinton... I think every, almost everybody knows Bill Clinton checked with almost everybody about almost every appointment. It would seem to me inconceivable that he wouldn't check with the most powerful part of his party, the National Education Association, the most powerful single block of delegates, about the appointment of the Secretary of Education. What do you think he said? This is in your face, NEA? I'm, I'm appointing whoever I want. I'm not a political guy? I don't think so. 
Former Secretary Bennett said that essentially the NEA was in charge. That's not true. I think Bennett believed it. But, you know, Bennett was quite confrontational, quite strident, and very often abrasive. But I don't think that's the case. The NEA certainly has a great deal of interest in education, obviously, and a great deal of knowledge of education. But uh, no one group, you know, runs Washington and runs education. When Bill Bennett says, hey, the NEA really has a hand on Dick Riley, you just, that you flatly reject that? I reject anybody uh, that has a, a hand in terms of controlling me and I think anyone from the NEA or any of the other organizations would tell you that and I think that's one reason uh, that, uh, that a lot of the teachers who belong to the NEA or whatever organization support me. I think what they want is somebody that is, is for education uh, and not for some organization. The NEA did try to have a hand in selecting Riley's top staff, but it didn't get all it wanted. It pushed for this woman, Dr. Sharon Robinson, a longtime NEA employee, to become either deputy secretary, the number two job, or undersecretary, the number three job. In the end, she got a job. She's one of 11 assistant secretaries. This is a very um, accessible administration. That's a good thing? Oh, I think it is. Yes, isn't that what democracy is about? Uh, as long as it's not only certain groups and not other groups, but, you know, I think in any given week, um, between all of us here in the administration, we speak to many, many groups, but nobody's in anybody's pocket. How accessible are they? While we were with the secretary, lobbyists from the National School Boards Association arrived to meet with Terry Peterson, Riley's counselor. Now, when I saw those guys waiting there, I said, what are you here to do? He said, we want to talk to Terry Peterson about the bill and, uh, and about money. Uh, I said, are you disappointed? He said, well, yeah, we're a little disappointed. Now, what did they say to you? Did they say well, they to Terry? Talked, they talked more about the uh, programs and, and the importance of education. And uh, we had a great discussion about how critical, for example, in their case, school boards are real interested in linking up with health and social services so that children at a disadvantage have, are looked at holistically so that we aren't just ca be, uh, compartmentalizing every little service so it makes no difference. Sure. So we got a good discussion about issues and, and I think the discussion was a lot less about money but more about good education and good so policy. They didn't come straight out. Well, it was they, all they, sort of... Well, I think it's natural. Every group who's, who's uh, 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 serving kids are trying to get additional resources. And uh, we have a limited federal budget. We're trying to cut the deficit, and so everybody's going to have to tighten their belt a little bit. But it doesn't surprise you to hear that some group of lobbyists would come in and want to talk to Terry or talk to somebody, and that, that just it sort of... It doesn't surprise me that a, that a group representing the school boards uh, uh, would have an issue to come in and talk to us about. Mm -hmm. You know, there's just constant mm -hmm. flow of people through here. What do all these education groups want? Well, we want very much to have him advance the cause of learning technologies, of the use of telecommunications and technological uh, devices in improving education. I want legislation that gets the federal government in the business of supporting the development of curriculum standards, of assessments, eventually of stakes, of a support system, support experimentation, and innovation. First off, uh, let me deal with the president rather than with Dick Riley because I think what this country needs is uh, a problem of the president's more than it is any one secretary. This country has to get a handle on the escalating health care costs. It is a sin that we pay more of our gross national product into health care than any other industrialized nation and 37 million Americans have no health care and if we continue on that path education and all other issues will be squeezed right out because there won't be money for anything else. What does higher education want from Secretary Riley and the Department of Education? I think what we want is a sense that education is a seamless web and that higher education is part of that seamless web. Does the Department of Education spend too much time focusing on elementary and secondary education, not enough on higher ed? 
we, we have to be concerned about that. It's not that we don't share the priority which they will assign. I think most of us in this business do understand. If you get the feeling he's not paying enough attention to higher education... We'll let him know. How will he know? You'll scream and yell? You'll... Well, we'll be polite, but we'll, we'll get his attention. The education groups know how to get the government's attention. They've lived in the neighborhood for a long time. One way is to throw a party. This party, given by a group of education associations, is honoring senators and representatives who are key players in education. However, not all the key players are elected or appointed. It's a combination of the, of the, usually the, the high-level uh, senior bureaucrats in the department, the senior staff members on the congressional committees on the Hill, and the, uh, and the uh, higher-ranking committee members uh, on the Hill, uh, as well as the key lobbyists, so that the, those people, uh, the key lobbyists, the staff members, the people who are, are, are except for, for the Congressional Committee Chairman, they're people who are not visible. They do have a lot of history, you know, and a lot of uh, background. And I don't think that it matters a whole lot, you know, who they're working for. Um, they, they do have that groundedness in the what's going on. The invisible government. That's right, the invisible government. And they really call the shots. See, these guys have often known each other for years, uh, and uh, they have interacted, and they have, learned, they have learned that one will take care of the other. It's that set of interactions, not all of which are always friendly, I might add, that gets things done. And that, I suppose, is what you're referring to with the invisible government. And that's alive and well? It's alive and well, yeah. Learning new rules. You know, I think the, this president has changed the rules on the budget uh, of how things work in this town and I think that uh, the rules uh, are changing because you no longer have the executive and legislative branch divided. People say you know there's an iron triangle the lobbyists, the career bureaucrats and the career staffers up here who really run things. Do the staffers really run things up here? We're fresh from the people and I think our input is hopefully I believe it is greater than that of all the other uh, uh, elements down here. Representative Kildee says he hopes the elected officials actually run Congress. I hope he hears this story. One of Riley's key people told me the department asked the Congress to rewrite some regulations to give the department more flexibility in administering a program. A staff person, not a senator or a congressman, said no. Why should we? You may only be here for four years. Well, there is a sense of urgency down there, the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue in the White House. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States, accompanied by the Secretary of Education. Well, you have a President and a uh, First Lady uh, who are very knowledgeable about education matters. Um, they respect Dick Riley, and I'm sure he's going to run that department, but uh, I'm sure that he's going to like the fact that uh, it's not one of those things where he's going to have to uh, wait online to see the President. <laughs> or maybe never get to see him, which was true of some secretaries of education. And that when he gets to see the president, he's going to have somebody who doesn't care, which is not going to be the case, or doesn't know. After all the testimony has been heard and all the bills have been passed and the funds have been raised and allocated, it all comes down to what happens between the teacher and the students in the classroom. He's quick, and when I talk to him about something, uh, if it's in a uh, youth apprenticeship program or if it's in national service or if it's in goals 2000, the education reform measures, whatever it is, he, he's on to it in a minute because he understands it and he and I have talked so many times about it. Uh, he is never going to put education on the back burner though. It's always going to be up front. Is Bill Clinton his own Secretary of Education? Does he really need Dick Riley? Uh, he needs Dick Riley. Uh, and he's got a wonderful uh, counterpart, if you will, for education in Dick Riley. So we want to see in every classroom, every classroom for all children, after the passage of this act, uh, develop with a, a partnership, a new role for the federal government, a partnership with all the states. All the, the president has to have a secretary who will do what Secretary Riley is doing being up on the hill every single day 
working the details of education legislation with those members whose job it is to work those details. The president can't do that. The worry that I think a, this administration has is that having so much of its own way when it looks up the hill, when it looks at the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue, Dick Riley's sitting there and there are friends up here and there are friends up there. They may even feel they have a lot of friends in the press at times, is that they get overconfident. A lot that a cabinet member can do is dependent on his support from the White House. He has to have strong support from the White House. And if there are different voices, uh, like typically the way it could work in a White House is there would be some people on the staff sympathetic to what Riley was doing. Uh, and then there would be other people on the White House staff who would typically, they would be the political operatives on the staff, who would say, what are you doing? You're making the teachers unions mad. We're going to need them when the election time comes around. Or we're going to need their support on other issues before Congress. You see, and that's often, that often is a, is a crucial uh, matter. I uh, have never felt in any way that uh, he was uh, constraining me in terms of my free expression, uh, free leadership uh, uh, it, it movements here in the education department. However, uh, uh, if he did, I would certainly uh, say in a hurry, I work for him. Uh, he's the president. He was the one that was elected, and I'm his secretary of education. Uh, this report is not about window dressing, and we must be honest in it. We must honestly report on progress and problems. We see that students across the board are not meeting the high standards that we have set. The National Press Club in Washington, D.C. A new report on mathematics achievement gives the secretary another opportunity to sound a familiar theme, the need for higher standards. The best magic comes from hard work and challenging curriculum, uh, engaging teaching, uh, improved practice driven by world-class standards. It asks more of everybody. It asks more of teachers and principals and parents and business people. Uh, the government, uh, it asks more of, of the school system. And it asks more of young students. Uh, so so it, it's what it is is, uh, is a workable system of, of overall improvement in, in education. But you can't tell the states and local communities to do this. No, but you can lead them, and that's, uh, that's so much better than telling them. What we need to do is really define in those standards uh, what children are expected to be able to do. How much math should they know? How much geometry? How much should they be able to write? Uh, should they know foreign languages and be skilled in the arts? So it isn't going to be like, you know, this is how you do it, A, B, C, and D. It'll be still a, a framework, an outline, and different states can fill in the details, and of course it will be voluntary. It is a delicate balance here. There's no question about it. On one hand, we can be accused of being too heavy-handed. On the other hand, we could be accused of not taking enough of a leadership role. What this administration is striving for is to take an appropriate leadership role and to make sure that nobody is left behind. So Riley comes in to broaden the goals, to set national standards, uh, develop some kind of national assessments to see if we're meeting the standards. We're moving toward nationalizing this business of schooling? Well, uh, not quite, uh, or at least nationalizing but not federalizing. That is, he isn't going to create the standards and the Congress isn't going to create the standards and the Department of Education won't. I think what you're going to see uh, him do is push for the availability of federal funds for states that want to develop standards uh, that are high. Standards are important for establishing what the nation expects of its children. Standards are also important to establish what the nation expects of its school systems, um, of its schools, what its states and what its localities must bring to the children in order to assure that they succeed. Riley is a guy who raised money in the state of South Carolina, Penny for your thoughts, um, but said we're going to raise standards too. He understands standards, I believe, and I think he understands standards to mean what most Americans think it to mean, not some fuzzy notion of outcome-based education, but you know, you score higher on a math test, you know more math. 
And if that's the kind of line that he pushes in regard to national standards, he will have trouble with a lot of the education special interests who do not want these kind of standards for reasons of their own or whatever. Uh, they have already indicated there have been letters gone around signed by all sorts of groups saying we oppose national standards for a whole host of reasons. If he, if he pushes for them, uh, he will have trouble. There are others of us, including many people in the House and the Senate, that also believe that we have to set a standard for schools, that we can't expect young people to succeed, and we can't expect teachers to be able to do their job if they have 45 children in a classroom, if they have kids coming to school that haven't been immunized and haven't had breakfast and haven't had lunch, so that when you talk about the standards, I want us to have standards for everybody. Uh, it, is, it is folly to be talking about equality in a state that spends $3,000 per youngster per year in one district and $9,000 per youngster per year in another district. I think that's what we're talking about when we say we want standards for a lot of areas and not just standards for students learning and not just standards for teachers. This is where it all starts to, you know, to fall apart because there are people within a given education group who come at national standards from different perspectives. And then there are people across the education groups that come at national standards from different perspectives. And even though they all love each other, you know, and they're all Democrats and they all, you know, are, are in favor of moving ahead now that, that we have a Democratic president and a Democratic Congress, they don't agree among themselves on what the standards should be, who should set them, who should um, monitor them. Uh, and then you've got this sort of outside groups opposed to the federal government getting into that business at all there's going to be a big fight about educational standards. There's absolutely no question about it. This is not going to be an easy one. There is a division right now on how far we should go on setting some school delivery standards. But we'll, we'll work those out. Why do you say we'll work those out? Because I think both sides want to work them out. The secretary certainly wants to work them out, and we do too. So I think we'll, we'll work out a, a how we uh, set standards for students, content standards, uh, what type of standards we might want to have as voluntary standards for schools, and then how we assess those standards. There's a real desire on both ends of the avenue to work any differences out. What, what does that mean, work it out? Does that mean close doors and fight it out and finally... Uh, some closed doors, some open doors, some compromises, some concessions, and some consensus. It's ultimately consensus. But that kind of an interplay, interchange uh, activity doesn't bother me in the least. It's a, it's a, it's an exciting thing, really, for me to try to move things through. You said interplay, interchange. You didn't say fight. Is that, is that not your style? <clears throat> it is if it becomes necessary, and I think people know that. Uh, and, uh, you know, I try, to, uh, I try to fight on top of the table, though, and not underneath. Fights or not, the question in Washington is, does Dick Riley have a fighting chance of improving education? Would we know he's being effective if people are getting angry at him? That's usually a very good sign. That's usually a very good sign. You, you, have, to, uh, you have to make some people mad, as, say, Bill Clinton did in Arkansas when he did something about education. What's my fear? Um, I fear that, I'll, that more money will be thrown after uh, good money. And whatever that phrase is. Um, and I fear that um, not much will happen, that we won't see any really uh, fundamental change and improvement in, in American education. We got to where we are over 12, 15, 20 years. We're not going to get out of this mess in a week or a month or a year. Oh, it's going to be very painful. It's going to be very slow because it means that everybody's going to have to change. It's going to mean teachers are going to have to do things differently. It's going to mean different relationship between teachers and supervisors. It's going to mean that students are going to have to work hard, much harder than they do now. It also means that some students are not going to be able to get into college eventually if they don't reach certain standards. I mean, we've got to reach a point where you don't go to a college and get your junior high school education and call it a bachelor's degree. This is a system that is going to have to be capable of continuous change and continuously reinventing itself 
to adapt to a very fast changing, highly technological society. But we hope that people will have more confidence in their schools and will have a sense that when they send their children off to school in the morning that they're safe, that they're learning something, and when they graduate that they'll be prepared to have a job. Will this change that you want be painful? No, it'll be, it'll be very exciting. It'll and, be and painful, though. Will it? it will not be painful. If it is, we ride right over that. It's, uh, it's worthwhile, and it's what the country must do, and, and it's the kind of pain that uh, makes you feel good. Before we leave Mr. Riley's neighborhood, maybe we should ask ourselves a couple of questions. What do we want from schools? What does it mean to be an educated person? Those are not trivial questions, and if we even try to answer them seriously, we'll be taking a big step in the right direction. For Learning Matters, I'm John Merrow. To find out more about this program, visit us at PBS Online at the Internet address on your screen. Learning Matters is made possible by grants from the people of Toyota, who believe that striving for excellence is not just a goal, but a way of life. Learning Matters is also made possible by grants from the Pew Charitable Trusts, Carnegie Corporation of New York, and the Rockefeller Foundation. Funding for this program is provided by Annenberg CPB to advance excellent teaching. For information about this and other Annenberg CPB programs, call 1-800-LEARNER and visit us at www.learner.org.